Hey, howdy everybody. Let's go ahead and carry on with the topic of Verigram interpretation. Now, last time when we were talking about Verigram calculation, in order to support the ideas around Verigram calculation, we did cover some very basic interpretation ideas. We talked about the fact that we have a SIL, and the SIL is the variance of the data that's used for the Verigram calculation. And so if we're dealing with data that has been normalized to have a variance equal to the standard deviation equal to 1, then we would expect that the SIL will be equal to 1. So a lot of students ask, how do we calculate the SIL? It's very straightforward. Just take the data that you're calculating the Verigram, calculate the variance of it, plot the SIL to support interpretation. The range is the distance at which the experimental Verigram reaches the SIL. The range is very important to us. I've talked about it before because beyond the range, we have no correlation. We know nothing, is what I often tell the class. In addition, when we get into Verigram modeling, you'll find out that the range is a critical parameter of the Verigram models that we use. The nugget effect is that variability that occurs at very short scales. In fact, distances less than the minimum data spacing. And we would also note that it would be represented or calculated, therefore, at distances less than the minimum or the smallest experimental lag distance. We'll talk about how we can use the nugget effect too. Now, we got to always be careful because the nugget effect, as we mentioned before, could be physically real, as in the case of gold and gold nuggets. It, in fact, is a very short scale change in the spatial continuity of the grade of gold due to the fact that you encounter naturally forming nuggets of gold that are significantly different than the usual ounces per ton type of measurements of gold. And also we have to be careful because nugget effect can also be the measurement error. So if you take a data set and you sprinkle in random uncorrelated measurement error, that would actually show up directly as nugget effect. So these were the three fundamental concepts of interpretation that we've covered so far. Let's go ahead and get into much more depth around Verigram interpretation. Geometric anisotropy is critical for Verigram interpretation and modeling. The idea is very straightforward. It simply is that the spatial continuity, the range of spatial continuity, depends on the direction. And so if we look at this spatial phenomenon right here, it's a 2D example. Through this lecture, I'll use a lot of 2D. It's very easy to visualize. We have a field of porosities between 4% and 16%. And we can see the porosity values at all possible locations. And if you look, you can see pretty obviously that there is a greater degree of spatial continuity in the X direction than in the y direction. And so what I've done is I took that phenomenon, I calculated the experimental verigram, the blue is in the y direction. Well, that will always be 0, 0, 0 azimuth for all of our examples. The y coordinate 0, 0, 0 assumption is pretty typical when it comes to the use of horizontal azimuths in verigram direction determination. The 0, 9, 0 will be orthogonal to that direction. It's in the x direction like this. And so we have green for the experimental verigram points in the 0, 9, 0 x direction. And if you look at that, we can calculate a range where we, a point where we reach close enough to the sill. We're, we're right there at the sill at around 300 meters. And I went to this image and I drew an arrow that's 300 meters. And then the, in the y direction, we reach the sill. A little bit of a wobble, a little bit of cyclicity. It's interesting. If you look vertically, you can see there's some cycling going on. But we reach the sill at about 150 meters. So about a 2 to 1 ratio of horizontal anisotropy. And so I drew the ellipse. And so effectively, this ellipse right here is our model of geometric anisotropy. It communicates the idea that in two principal directions of continuity, the x, which we will always know as 
the direction with greater continuity in horizontal, we'll call it the horizontal major, and the direction with orthogonal to it will be the horizontal minor, and then this ellipse is representative of the behavior at, for all angles in between or off diagonal to the major and the minor. And so this is a model of geometric anastropy. We calculated, identified and calculated the ranges in the major and the minor, and we can plot it and look at it, and we'll use it for modeling later on. It will be central to everything we're doing with modeling. In fact, we commonly find that most of our spatial phenomenon does have geometric anastropy. It's all over the place and we use it to model. Vertical range of correlation is often much less shorter than the horizontal range due to depositional processes, the way that the rock is being laid down. Geologists know this. They talk about the difference between vertical and horizontal type of relationships, and they know it as Walter's Law. And they teach it and they recognize it from their outcrops and all of their various geo data sets. And once again, geostats is a numerical representation of geology. It's a practical science around geologic modeling, so it makes sense that we represent that numerically. The ratio of horizontal to vertical is commonly known as the horizontal to vertical anastropy ratio. Geometric anastropy is also common in the horizontal direction, just like in this example. This is all horizontal. X, Y, 0, 0, 0, 0, 9, 0 in this direction right here. And in, once again, the ratio of the horizontal major direction, this direction here, to the horizontal minor direction is commonly known as the horizontal major to minor anastropy ratio. And as we calculate variograms, we will consistently see this type of behavior. When we calculate in the two primary directions that are orthogonal to each other, we'll often see the range greater in one direction, less in the other direction. And once again, just so nobody gets this wrong in my class, the direction with the greatest spatial continuity, in other words, the greater range, is known as the major. And the one with the less range is known as the minor direction and they must be orthogonal to each other, 90 degrees separated from each other. That's how we parameterize geometric anastropy. Now, I want to kind of hit this a little bit harder because when we model, we're going to use geometric anastropy all the time. So what we'll do is we'll zoom into that problem. That's all I did here. I took one of these ellipses, I zoomed into it. Once again, I've drawn this arrow to 300 meters. This is 150 meters. We got the ranges right. This is the major, this is the minor. And this geometric anastropy model allows you to be able to calculate the range in all possible directions, not just the minor and the major. And so I've drawn 0, 3, 0, 0, 0, 6, 0. Of course, off diagonal angles, I could have picked 0, 1, 3, 13 degrees, or whatever I want to pick. Now, it's going to provide us a valid measure of spatial continuity for all of these directions. And the way it's going to look it's going to look like an interpolation or a stretching and squeezing of the common structure. In fact, if you look at this structure or this shape in the minor and you stretch it out, it's actually equal to what we have in the major. So we're using the same shape. We're just stretching it or squeezing it in order to find all of these off diagonal directions and their associated ranges and the varigram values for any possible distance. That's the geometric anastropy model. It's effectively the major, the minor, the shapes are consistent between the major and the minor, and then an interpolation between them. And you could look at the ellipse here. This ellipse, the line on this ellipse, so this would be the range in 000, 150. This is the range in 090 azimuth, which is 300. And this line is the range in all of the other directions. So it's pretty cool. We have a consistent full two-dimensional. Now, of course, you can take this ellipse, and if you add another axis, you'll get a ellipsoid, which is a three-dimensional representation. And so doing that, you now have a full, all possible direction representation of the anastropy directional anastropy. Okay, and this is all critical because when we start modeling, 
We're going to build our variogram models by partitioning the total variance of the problem. The sill is the total variance. We're going to break it up into components, and over each component, we're going to have a different spatial structure, variogram model, that has to act over all directions. And brought all together, they provide you a full three-dimensional model of all the variances combined. And so it's a very powerful concept. That's what we use. We use this geometric anastropy to do that. Cyclicity, another structure, structure that we often see when we're calculating variograms. I gave myself a very simple problem here. If you look at it carefully, you'll notice that there's systematically higher values here, lower, higher, lower. Do you see the cycles here? There's heterogeneity. It's not perfectly just cyclic, but this is higher, this is lower, higher. And so you can see there's these cycles. So many natural phenomenon have cycles. Geology tends to cycle. There's changes systematically in forcing, allogenic, autogenic, causes all kinds of interest in fining up, prorating out, so forth. Sometimes these cycles are not real. Sometimes if you have sparse data, it's just due to the fact that you just have too few data to calculate a variogram, and so you see a bunch of noise. So we got to be careful. We got to make sure that we have a clean signal with the cycles and that we have enough data to support it. So if I gave myself this problem right here and I calculate the variogram in the vertical direction and the horizontal direction, you'd be able to tell which direction was vertical immediately because we have this, the vertical direction is crossing this layering, these cycles. So it's resulting in the cyclic behavior in the variogram. So what can we say about this? Well, first of all, the cycles in the variogram have a wavelength. If we go from here to here, just over maybe about 200 meter wavelength in the cycle. Now, what's really cool about that is if we look at this data set right here, we'll realize that about every 200 meters, we have a cycle. And so you can interpret the cycles in the lag distance directly as the cycles in the spatial phenomenon that we're studying. Another feature that we often see is zonal anastropy. Now you'll notice I kept the same problem, the same example where we had the cycles and the actually, actually the same experimental variograms that we calculated before. And so in this example, we saw a pairing of cyclicity in one direction and in the other direction, we saw the variogram rise up and fail to reach the sill. It leveled off at what we'll call an apparent sill. So when the experimental variogram does not reach the sill in a direction, we call this zonal anastropy. It's often paired with cyclicity or some type of trend in the other orthogonal direction. Now it's very interesting because just like we could interpret directly from the features of cyclicity, we can interpret directly from zonal anastropy. In fact, the variability within the layers is in fact about 77%. And if you look at it, the variogram has risen to about 0.77. So the proportion of the variance that's experienced within the layers is where the apparent silt will rise to. In addition, the remaining variability is now the variability between the layers, the variability that on average we see in difference between being in and out of layers. And that is this other component right here. And if you look at it, you'll see that the cyclicity occupies that component of the variability. So it's very cool. You can interpret, once again, the apparent sill will, will be at the variability, the proportion of variability within the layers. And the missing part, the difference between the true sill and the parent sill, is the variability between the layers. Yeah, so another important feature, zonal anastropy, trend. Now, if you look really careful at this data set, it's heterogeneous. It's, it's, it's got lots of different features in it. But in general, the values are higher and they fine in the y direction. It becomes lower porosity as we go up more blues and purples, more oranges and yellows down here. Trends are everywhere. In fact, in my experience modeling reservoirs, I think 
we probably use some type of trend model on almost every RISBO model. They occur everywhere in nature. So when you have a trend in your data, the varigram in that direction that's experiencing the trend, so the trend is in the y direction here, the y direction varigram, the blue, notice what it does. It rises up and then it carries on above the sill in this manner. Just takes off and keeps going above the sill. That is trend structure in varigram interpretation. Now, when you see that trend structure, if you're kind of keen about geostats, you've probably seen in the book that there's power law models, there's fractal type models that can account for that increasing variability as you go to larger and larger scales. But the problem is, is that we often use varigrams for the purpose of simulation. And when we do work with simulation, we have to model to the sill. In addition, if we have a trend, it's much better to model that trend deterministically to remove it from the data. So effectively, we take this data set right here, and on every row, we would calculate the average porosity. We'd get a function that would be decreasing, and we would subtract that function, that trend model, from every value in this two-dimensional model, and the result would be something that would have a stationary mean. We wouldn't expect it to be all yellow down here and all blue up here. It would balance it out it would be a stationary residual with the trend removed. Once we remove the trend, then we would model the residual. And when we calculate the varigram on the residual, we would probably see that now it reaches the sill and it no longer goes exceeds the sill and keeps going. It would in fact be like a more typical type of varigram structure without a trend feature in it. And so that's the typical workflow. But at the same time, it's important to recognize that when we see this type of structure in an experimental varigram, it's indicating that there's trend. And that's very diagnostic. You could go to the data, remove the trend, and then test it again by calculating a varigram and establish whether or not the trend has been removed by how the varigram is behaving. Does it still have trend structures to it? Now, the main point here is that it turns out that rarely are varigrams textbook. In other words, they don't typically just have trend, zonal anstropy, geometric anstropy, and cyclicity. They usually have combinations. And so this image taken directly from the book includes a whole variety. Let's just talk through a couple together right now. So if you had this type of an experimental varigram, in one of the directions you calculate the varigram, what would you think of that? Well, I think immediately you'd see that there's cyclicity. But the interesting thing about the cyclicity is it's climbing consistently upwards. And so this is a combination of cyclicity and trend types of type of structure. Here's a nice example of trend structure. That's a beautiful one. That's really nice. Here's another example with cyclicity. Here's an example where we have an inflection point and then we have trend. And so there's some interesting things going on, kind of a multi-spatial frequencies going on there. Here's an example of zonal anstropy. So we have all kinds of different features. Well, zonal anstropy perhaps with some cyclicity in it too. So there's often going to be complication. There's going to be a superposition of multiple types of structures that we can interpret and try to understand at different spatial frequencies. And so varigram calculation and interpretation can be pretty rich and very interesting. Now I want to give Dr. Clayton Deutsch credit. He was my PhD advisor and um, you'll notice that some of these slides in this presentation are either taken from one of his courses, which great appreciation for permission to do that and to use them in my class. I do appreciate that, and or also modified. And so, of course, you know, um, being my advisor, you probably find that there's a variety of things I do that are inspired by Clayton Deutsch. And so appreciation to him. And basically, in respect to Clayton Deutsch, I thought I'd show this example because I think it shows a certain level of his cool nerdiness. And Clayton, I hope I said, I hope you're not uh, bothered by nerdiness, but I think nerdiness is a good term nowadays. And so um, this example right here was, I don't know if you remember in the good old days when people used to go to malls. I think people still do. 
there was a display with a rock, and I think it was Aeolian, some type of sedimentary rock, which was nicely polished. He bought the rock, took it home, put it on a scanner and scanned it in. The first thing he did was calculate the barogram of it. And I just think that's so cool. And so if you look at this nice example right here, I think immediately you can pick out which is the y direction, which is the x direction. These cycles right here clearly are going vertical or in the y direction, I should say. And this right here, this direction right here would be along the layers, right? And so what's very cool about this example is that you get a really nice example of what we call dampened hole effect. And what causes dampened hole effect? Well, if the cyclicity was persistent and was consistent, I should say, and persistent, like the thickness of the cycle stayed the same and they kept going the whole way through the data set, we would expect the cyclicity to remain pretty consistent. But in this example right here, you can see the thickness of the units are changing. You also see that they're getting kind of disrupted a bit. And so this general kind of irregularity within the cycles leads to a situation where over short distances, you've got pretty obvious cycling, okay? Over longer distances, what we're seeing is that at, a, at longer distances, we're getting out of sync. Sometimes we have a good cycle, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we don't. You see that over that same distance, things are either lining up or not lining up. At longer distances, it starts to get confused. And so that causes the dampened effect. In addition, you don't see zonal arms troppy in this example. Not really. The reason being is because of these ripple type structures, I think they are, and because of the changes in thickness and so forth and undulations here, in the horizontal direction, you do eventually see all the variability. It's not a case where you don't see the variability. So this is a great example. Another point we should make is that the Veragram model is a measure of the change, the change measured by a Veragram. It's an average squared difference, one half of pairs separated by a lag distance versus distance. And if you think about it geologically speaking, geologic distance is really change. The way that the rock changes is often interpreted as a geologic distance. And this distant distance right here is just plain old Euclidean distance, separation in space. And so the Veragram is like a function that helps us go between Euclidean distance and geologic distance. So let's just summarize, review some of the Veragram interpretation ideas that have come up so far. We've talked about the Veragram. It's important to measure spatial continuity. We showed in the last lectures that spatial continuity impacts the response of the subsurface to things like um, drilling for hydrocarbons, could be the case if you're trying to drill for water, whatever type of resource, grades, and mineral deposit, or whatever it might be. As we mentioned in the last lecture, if we are working in a flattened stratigraphic framework, we have to ensure that we calculate the Veragram in that same framework. The coordinate transformations have been applied. If we're working with Gaussian type of modeling methodologies, we have to ensure the data has been transformed to Gaussian. Or if we're working with indicator-based methods, we have to transform the data to indicator or truncations or whatever it might be. We have to be consistent. We calculate the Veragram in the same data and coordinate space as where we'll be modeling. The interpretation principles we covered, trend, cyclicity, geometric, and zonal anastropy. As we go into modeling, interpretation modeling the Veragram, keep in mind that the short scale structure is often most important. A lot of the action happens in short scales. We have to make predictions near a well. We have to rely on very few wells at very short distances. We don't have a lot of data to help us at short distances. We also have to be cognizant of what's the size of the model cells that we're working with because, of course, we cannot capture structures below the resolution of the model when we're modeling, and so this will influence how we focus for Veragram modeling. Vertical direction Veragrams are typically pretty well informed. That's because our data tends to be in the vertical direction. Even in unconventionals, where we have very long horizontal reaches, the well logs 
and other type of detailed information is usually constrained to the original vertical well before the, before the drilling of the associated horizontal reach. Due to the limited number of wells, we are often challenged to calculate and to model horizontal barograms. And so we will often rely on analog information, mature fields with more data, outcrop information. We will often focus on the vertical, which is much better informed, and then use our geometric anisotropy model in order to, with an anisotropy ratio, horizontal to vertical, in order to understand the spatial continuity in the horizontal direction from the vertical and knowledge about this ratio. Okay, so a bit of a spoiler alert because I want people to make sure they understand where we're going. This lecture series has been pretty lengthy when it comes to spatial continuity. There's a lot to talk about. What's it all about? What are we doing this all for? We need to practically calculate and model spatial continuity. That's it. None of this is for fun. We're doing it for real practical reasons. So we have to do this from available and often sparse subsurface data. And so in the previous lecture, we talked about the use of search templates in order to take care of the part of having sparse data, irregularly sampled data, even with regularly sampled data. We still want to pull pairs together over a range of distances in order to get a reliable varigram. We can't be way too specific in calculating the varigram. We need to have tolerances in order to get something that's interpretable. So that's complete. That's done. We can check that off our list. Now we've explained interpretation, but our next steps are to get into valid spatial models. How do we fit with a couple different nested additive spatial continuity models, including nugget, spherical, exponential, Gaussian, and so forth, how do we fit these in order to formulate a valid model? And then fitting these how do we extend that and understand spatial continuity in full three dimensions? We're going to model in primary directions. We'll talk a lot about major horizontal, minor horizontal, vertical, and we're going to combine them together with the concept of geometric anisotropy. So everything we've been talking about is going to build up and in the end we'll be able to characterize the spatial continuity with full valid three-dimensional models. And so that's where we're going. We, these interpretation skills that we just gathered will be critical to be able to move forward into the next phase of being able to model the varigram. And that's it for interpretation. We'll next cover modeling. I, if you have any feedback, questions, comments, suggestions, anything, just go ahead and um, drop me a line. I'm easy to find. My email at the school here I'm Michael Perch. I'm a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. Thank you very much for listening.